two, one, go. Guess where we are? On top of an apartment block? On a golf course? Perhaps in a theme park? Or a shopping center? Nope. We're in the middle of the sea, on the world's biggest ship, as tall as an 18-story building, higher than the Eiffel Tower, the harmony of the seas is a nautical record breaker, capable of accommodating 8,500 people. A floating holiday resort, full of the kind of innovations you wouldn't expect aboard a ship, like an indoor park with 10,000 plants and plant walls, surrounded by cafes and restaurants where you could almost forget you're not on dry land. A cocktail bar staffed by robot barmen. And even an ice rink with nightly ice dancing shows. Dream cruises at dream prices on ever more breathtaking ships. Last year, 25 million holidaymakers boarded these marine leviathans. That's twice as many as a decade ago. Over here, gentlemen. The shipyards are under pressure. They have to deliver 67 ships in the next seven years. A race to build giants. But at what cost? From the Mediterranean to the Bahamas, via India and the USA, join us on a tour of the world of cruises. A journey full of surprises, far removed from the cliches that these maritime giants leave in their wake. Our odyssey begins on the shores of the Mediterranean in Marseille. Oh wow, amazing, it's huge. This is their first cruise aboard this ship, the biggest the company owns. Look, there's the restaurant. Pretty impressive. Sandrine Amplement and her two sons have been dreaming about this holiday for months. I can't wait to see what it's like inside. Mm, smells like holidays. For the next week, the family can enjoy the festive atmosphere. The three swimming pools, jacuzzis, and unlimited activities, all for just 550 euros per person. For Dylan and Christopher, the main attraction is the slide, 30 meters up. Heck. <laughs> I knew it. Some slide. How was it? It was great. Cruises aren't like they were in the past, when they were for older people. Now they're aimed at families, even those with young kids, even babies. It's amazing. Along with 4,000 other passengers, Sandrine will roam the Mediterranean for seven days stopping off in Italy, Malta, and Spain. It isn't just the itinerary that tempts holiday makers, it's the boat itself. Music on every floor, glitzy furnishings, Sandrine is in her element. Take a butchers at this. My jewelry. 
My jewellery matches the stairs. It's lovely. I only came on this cruise for the stairs. The ship has become a destination in itself. It's classy. For the next week, Sandrine and her boys will be spoiled for choice. There are eight restaurants, seven bars, and different shows every night. Making the ship the main attraction was a visionary innovation created 40 years ago. Miami, the biggest cruise port in the world. This is where we met the pioneer who made being on board a ship a new way to holiday. Now enjoying his retirement at home. For 35 years, Bob Dickinson ran Carnival, the world's leading cruise company. He proudly remembers his glory days. What's this poster? So this is a, uh, a movie poster. They called it the killer year. That's a phrase I used at the time. We're having a killer year. We're good. We had good numbers. And so everything was a delicious uh, potpourri of excellent results. Bob made a killing thanks to a stroke of genius that revolutionized the world of cruising. The first cruises took place in the 19th century aboard luxury ships crossing the Atlantic. At the time, this mode of travel was the preserve of the elite. But in the 1960s, air travel offered major competition. So to attract new customers, ships became luxury floating hotels. With floating cities all around the globe, Funville reinvented the way people vacation. In 1972, Carnival inaugurated its new ship, the Mardi Gras. His choice of name, synonymous with celebration, was no accident. Bob Dickinson wanted ships to become a destination in themselves. Everybody else is promoting the ports of call in their ads. On a seven-day cruise, 80% of the time is spent on the ship. Only 20% in the ports of call. We talked about what went on in the ship. And because we had a big ship for the time, we could say three swimming pools, gym, four bands and orchestras, uh, eight bars and lounges, and we could sort of dress the people in the experience as to what happens on board the ship. The propitious arrival of a TV series promoted this idea. Love, exciting and new. During the 1980s, the Love Boat promoted his idea of cruise holidays. We're expecting you. Love Boat was a wonderful phenomenon because it explained in a, in a half hour show what was happening on board ships and it brought it into people's living rooms. And to make money from these ships, he came up with a foolproof recipe. You could make more money by lowering the price and having more people because a significant part of the profit was onboard revenue. So if you had uh, 900 people on board, they're in the casino, they're having photographs taken, taking shore tours and, and so on. So they were, they were spending, uh, they're in the gift shops as well, they were spending money on board. A recipe that made a fortune for Bob and his company. Even today, nothing has changed. On board, there's ample opportunity to spend. At the end of this corridor, Sandrine is pursuing her dream of a massage. Hello, miss. I'd like some information about the spa, please. But on finding out the prices, 70 euros for half an hour, 99 euros for 45 minutes, 126 for 55 minutes. She's a little disappointed. It's quite expensive, isn't it? On average, these spas cost 30% more than those on dry land. 
I'm not surprised. It's always going to cost a bit more, even a lot more on a cruise. I never fall into the trap, though. Sandrine does treat herself to the cheapest massage. 10 euros for 10 minutes. Temptations are on every floor of the ship. Resistance is futile. The traditional photo with the captain is only 28 euro. It's great, it's classy, it's a cruise. And it wouldn't be a cruise without a shopping trip to one of the ship's nine shops. Dominoes? Can I look at a large? Is this a temptation boat? A little. You can enjoy yourself. You can enjoy yourself in the shops. I have to go on a diet. And, of course, in the casino. The cruise companies have also hit the jackpot, creating a new oasis of temptation. This time on dry land. A temptation that's been hard to resist. The Bahamas in the Caribbean. An archipelago made up of 700 islands, many of them private and the refuge of a great number of millionaires. This is where the cruise companies have bought little plots of paradise, reserved for the sole use of their passengers. The islands of Castaway Cay, Great Stirrup Cay, Coco Cay, and further south, Princess Keys and Little San Salvador. Dream destinations and a new selling point. Coco Key is one of my favorite destinations. It's a private destination for Royal Caribbean, so there is no other ships in port that day it belongs to you. So you come to the island and it's your private resort for the day. I would say it's the closest thing you're gonna to get to paradise. Beautiful white sands, but if you're adventurous, you can go snorkeling, they got wave runners, you can go parasailing. I mean, there's so much to see, so much to do. We wanted to get a closer look at this tourist paradise, but the company wouldn't allow us to visit. So we joined the 2,400 passengers on board and filmed the cruise secretly. 12 hours later, Coco Island came into view. Here we were to spend the day. The ship was too big to moor, so we reached the island on a smaller boat. This desert island is visited by thousands of tourists every week. Members of the crew accompany them, carrying food and drinks. Everything in this tropical fantasy has a price. Hi, can I have some water, please? How much it is? Too long. OK. Even using the beach costs money. 16 euros for a mat. Two hundred euros for a bungalow. The activities will hit you in the pocket too. Thirty-eight euros for an hour and a half kayaking. Sixty euros for an hour and a half scuba diving. Ninety-two euros for an hour on jet ski. Going on these inflatables costs thirty-two euros, and it's twenty-three euros to go on the slide. And of course. There are plenty of souvenirs on offer. At around 4 p.m., the tourists return to the ship, leaving behind them a trail that inhabitants of the neighboring islands will clean up. It's good. It's good for business. It's good for uh, everything, actually. And, you know, without you, there's no job for us. Piecemeal work for the locals big profits for the cruise company. It's a dream. Not a single euro will escape their clutches, not even on dry land. Nowadays, every cruiser wants an island of their own. The most remarkable is 100 kilometers from Miami on the island of Ocean Cay. This 40 hectare island is being transformed into a tourist's paradise. 
the company has seen things on a pharaonic scale. This is how the island will look in two years' time. Six beaches, restaurants, bars, shops, a totally artificial lagoon, and even a 2,000-seat amphitheater. The ship will bring tourists straight to the island. The whole project has cost some 180 million euros. The cruiser's monopoly over the Bahamas is becoming contentious. We now travel east to the island of Spanish Wells. The island's 800 inhabitants mainly make their living from fishing and tourism. Theo Lin has built his dream home here. Four years ago, this native of Utah left his mountain home to this idyllic spot. I started coming as a child to the Bahamas and I'm fortunate enough to be able to retire here. And it's wonderful. We love it. But today, the future of his earthly paradise is under threat. Theo takes us to a neighboring island much coveted by the cruise companies. This is Egg Island, Disney Cruise Line. It was anxious to buy the island and turn it into a private cruise port. Egg Island has two inland lakes and teems with lush vegetation. It's owned by the Bahamian government. But Disney, which owns four cruise ships, dreamt of transforming this island beyond recognition. They would probably try to make the beach larger they would dredge sand and then grind up the sand to make uh, this powdery white idea of heaven, I guess. But five or 6,000 people on a tiny island like this would obviously have a huge impact and a negative impact. Theo insists on being our guide, introducing us to the island's hidden secrets. The heart of this island and all of the fish grow up in these ponds, and all the mangroves uh, provide habitat for them. It's just a, it's so full of life. You can see all these little mangrove spears. This is how they, they sprout. This is a natural refuge for the fish and conches that live among these mangroves. This is a nursery. Just in this small area, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight conch. They're safe, and when they're big enough, they move out to the deeper water. I don't know if you can see his foot. I mean, you can see the, these conch are unmolested, but imagine if there were 1,000 people on the island. It would be a different story. Egg Island is one of the few to have escaped the onslaught of mass tourism. Theo has made it his mission to resist the attentions of predatory developers. Last July, this former lawyer launched an internet petition in a bid to halt the project. It was 3,397 supporters in two weeks, just in two weeks in this small country. This was enough to make the company give up its ambitions. Disney knew at that point that they would not be welcome, and that's a, bus that's a difficult business environment. Fishing boats might blockade the operation, that we might protest every time a ship pulled in. Can you imagine? The threat has been repelled, but the island is far from safe. To stop any invasion from the cruise companies, Theo wants the Bahamian government to designate the island as a nature reserve. Help from the local community is paramount, and a new mobilization is afoot. Hey, Bruno, you got just a minute? <clears throat> I didn't know if you had customers today or not, but... I just to... This tour guide shows holidaymakers around Egg Island. 
Theo knows exactly what argument he needs to get Bruno's support. More people will find out about um, Spanish wells and the fact that there's a protected area, and, uh, and they'll come here to see it. Yeah. You'll have more business. Everybody have more business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a good thing to preserve it because it's the last place we have from here to go to beaches, to take tourists to. Everything else is sold out. They see the island's classification not just as a way of protecting its environment, but also of safeguarding its economy. If there was a cruise port there or any other big development, we just won't see the benefit. And we'll lose part of this, this community's heritage, gone forever. Theo's battle against the cruise ships is also motivated by the effect they have on the environment. A cruise ship is a floating city, which is always on the move. On board, tourists use the numerous pools, jacuzzis, and showers. An average of five million liters of water pump from the sea every week. That's the equivalent of two Olympic-sized swimming pools. Once treated, the water is pumped back into the sea. The members of this holiday club avidly consume what's on offer in the ship's bars, restaurants and buffets. A week's cruise equals over 100,000 meals. This life at sea creates as much waste as a town of 4,000 inhabitants. On average, the ship staff collects 20,000 plastic bottles and 25,000 drinks cans. Some companies have no scruples when it comes to disposing of their refuse. In 2013, one passenger filming at night captured images of dozens of bin bags being thrown into the sea off the coast of Brazil. It wasn't just food waste, because you could hear the clinking of bottles and cans. And when one of the bags split, you could see milk cartons floating in the sea. This is common practice. According to an employee who covertly filmed one of his colleagues the same year on the very same boat, since then, the company has been fined 600,000 euros. So how is waste managed aboard these maritime giants? One company agreed to discuss this delicate subject with us, allowing us to film its bins. This is the cruise corridor. Everything here is clean and smoothly run. First thing in the morning, the procession of stewards dispose of the passengers' rubbish. Each bin is color-coded, and everything on board is sorted. That's the law. Officer Nicolas Fortunato follows close behind. He has to make sure that everything's being properly sorted, even in the restaurant kitchens. How is it going? Everything is fine. Nicolas's inspections cause much trepidation. Did you check well? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. It's separated. Yeah. I want to check. It's fine for you? Yes. It's all plastic, sir. Okay. All okay. the cups I put here. Okay, very good. Fine. What would happen if it wasn't properly sorted? Uh, they'd get away with it once or twice, maybe three times, but any more than that, and they'd be in for it. And that's not to be taken lightly. We have to follow it uh, precisely, or else <laughs> we will have an uh, infraction or something. Oil infraction. Yes. This fine can be up to 20 euros deducted from their pay a far from insignificant amount to these employees. Once sorted, waste is brought here for treatment. How is it going? Just... Cardboard boxes, tin cans,
glass, everything gets compacted or crushed to save valuable space on board. The refuse is then taken ashore for recycling. The company is clearly making an effort to protect the environment and make sure everyone on board knows it. Hi, Nico. How are you? Thanks to Patricia Gomez, the ship's chief leisure coordinator. Have you got something for me? I've always got something for you. She's helping with the bins as part of her preparation for an activity. Fantastic! These are great, and they're different colors too, perfect. I think, uh, well, I'm planning to make an aquarium for the children, so I think this would be perfect sea weeks. I like them very much, and also some kind of coral. You have quite an imagination. I do. <laughs> Whoa, kids, look at the whale. Here comes the whale. These educational games help Patricia promote the company's image to the young passenger's parents. The sea is polluted not just by fishing nets, but also by plastic thrown away by humans. So, we're going to get rid of everything that's polluting the sea. Now, get your animals and let's build a brand new clean aquarium. One, two, three, go. What do we never throw overboard when we're on a boat? Rubbish. That's right. Well done. Thank you, children. I do hope that they come back and above everything that they do protect our sea as much as we do. <laughs> However, there is a fly in the ointment that the cruise companies don't like to talk about. What's being burned and belched out of the ship's funnels? This is Marseille, France's main cruise port. 500 ocean liners dock here every year, twice as many as a decade ago. These maritime behemoths are part of the landscape of the city. But their looming presence is starting to cause disquiet. Sitting on their terrace, Michel and Claude Rosier are enjoying retirement and the magnificent scenery. What a lovely view. A spectacular landscape which in recent years has been usurped by the cruise ships. There, there it goes, look, pulling out of the docks. The incessant dance of these sea giants takes place before their very eyes. Oh my, when I see that I want to go off with it. But reality soon hits home. Oh no, can you see that smoke? Oh my God, look, look at it, look at that smoke, oh no, just belching out. Oh, the exhaust smoke soon becomes an irritation. It gets you right in the throat. Can you smell it? Yeah, it's like an itch. It's an absolutely revolting smell. It's making my nose and throat sting. I'm, I'm just sick to death of it. I think it must be very polluting, very, very toxic. Are the plumes of smoke that come out of these ships toxic to the people of Marseille? Looming on the distant horizon, a morning arrival is making its way into the port of Marseille, watched by a group of people who are not big fans of the cruise ships. Oh my God, it's huge. Yeah. 12 chimneys, that's right. These environmental activists are observing the smoke billowing from the ship's funnels. The smoke is particularly polluting because cheap, heavy fuel is used to power the ship. 
The burning fuel carries fine particulates of sulfide dioxide. According to this German expert, the level of fine particulate emissions from ships is greater than that from cars. One cruise ship emits as much as one million cars on particles per day. You can imagine how many cars you have in, in Marseille. It's less than one cruise ship emits per day. So it's not possible that they have no impact. It's a huge impact. The ship starts maneuvering into port. Charlotte Lepitre and Daniel Rigier have their eyes glued on the ship's funnels. The cloud of smoke is actually staying a very long time and visible in the atmosphere. I mean, it must be very thick. Once docked, the ship uses maritime diesel, which is less polluting than shipping fuel, but contains 100 times more sulfur than motoring fuel. The cruise ships stay in the port and the engines keep running for the whole hotelery um, power supply that is needed. So you have like uh, power plants directly in the middle of the city. So um, this, this is really what, what makes the, the health and environmental problems. What impact is this pollution having on the city center? To find out, they head to the railway station in the heart of Marseille, using this detector to monitor the level of fine particulates in the air. They're mainly interested in the ultrafine particles, as they are, according to the scientist, the most harmful, penetrating deeply into the respiratory system. And this is really a, a huge number. We have 20,000. In Berlin, at the same location, you would have 6,000. And this means it's all this traffic, the buses and trucks and cars. But in addition here in Marseille, because it's a harbor, you get the influence of the boats, of the big ships, all influence this pollution level, which is very high compared to a very good city. The pollution is even more noticeable when the ships have set sail. Their next set of data is collected in a residential quarter near the port. The team sets up its equipment in a playground, which overlooks a departing ship. Oh, you can smell it. Do you smell? And you can see the smoke going up. The ship's chimneys once more start belching out smoke from burning fuel. As it leaves, the level of particulates is 13,000 per cubic centimeter of air and rising. You can see the ultrafine particulates coming through now. Yes, you can see the wind blowing this way. The level is rising. And this is just the beginning. The meter's going crazy now. <laughs> I was going to say we'd reached 38,000. Then it went up to 41,000. Now it must be about, about 43,000. The level reaches a peak of 57,000. There are no safety standards relating to ultrafine particulates. But research shows that they have a detrimental effect on health. So it's the people who live near the port who will be regularly breathing in these particulates and so will be more vulnerable to heart problems, respiratory problems, lung cancers, and so on. In June 2015, a study by a reputed German university established a direct link between emissions from crews and commercial shipping and the incidence of lung and cardiovascular diseases. People living by the coast are the most vulnerable. This peak level of pollution was recorded in the same part of town that Michel, our retired Marseille resident bothered by smoke, lives. <laughs> So that's something we could organize. We find her in the middle of a residents association meeting. Everyone is worried. Aside from itching throats, people have noticed very clear evidence of pollution. This, this is what built up on my blinds. This is what I brushed off. It's not just dust. You can see the grease that's stayed on the paper. He had never seen so much of this greasy soot, previous to Marseille's cruise ship boom. Jean-Pierre Hérault 
has concerns about the consequences for his health. So, as for me, I've just had throat cancer, and I've never been a smoker. Someone we know very well sadly died of lung cancer. Never smoked. Never. It's been carnage in the last few years. I can't help but think that there's a link between the increasing numbers of cruise ships. We're talking eight, nine, ten boats arriving at the same time every day causing a colossal amount of pollution and my illness. Yet I was very sporty, never smoked, so... Jean-Pierre has lived in this district for 20 years, as has Lucienne Brun, who also suffers from health problems. I'm being tested for potential lung cancer. I am just waiting for the final results. These residents are demanding a survey to measure the impact of the ship's exhaust fumes on the local area. Pollution from cruise ships is going to be the battleground for 2017. Things need to happen quickly. The situation can't be allowed to go on. For the time being, it's not possible to establish a definite link between their illnesses and the smoke from the cruise ships. Until now, this pollution has been very low on the list of priorities. And if the inhabitants of the port of Marseille are being exposed to this pollution, what about ship's passengers? We decided to join a cruise to find out more. This time, we took measurements while the ship was sailing and the engines were going full throttle. Using the monitor borrowed from our German expert Axel, we measured the level of ultrafine particulates to which the ship's passengers were being exposed. In order to remain undetected, only the probe protruded from my bag. The figures rose alarmingly fast. It's rising. 50,000, 69,000, 70,000, 91,000, it's peaked at 109,000. 109,000 fine particulates per cubic centimeter of air. Passengers reclining on their loungers were breathing in five times as many particulates as were present in Marseille train station. As I moved around, the numbers kept changing. 52,000, 60,000, 71,000, 84,000. I've got a high of 237,000. We made our way to the upper deck, where there's a jogging track close to the funnels, and another peak was reached. 307,000. 307,000 ultrafine particulates is what this jogger is breathing in. As for this woman basking lazily in the sun, it's even worse. 380,000 particulates. The numbers kept fluctuating, but still remained at a higher level than in the center of Marseille. One question needs to be asked. Why is this sulfur-rich fuel that emits such a large quantity of fine particulates still authorized for use? Our journey now takes us to the banks of the Thames in London. London is the seat of the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. This body is responsible for regulating the kind of cruise ships that have pride of place in the organization's foyer. These proud vessels don't impress this environmental activist. For 15 years, John Maggs has lobbied the IMO trying to convince them to use less polluting fuel. Of all the industries, they should have been promoting cleaner fuels, and they weren't. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a real disappointment. And I think it's a, it's a shame because, you know, their customers, you know, they don't, they don't go on a cruise um, to be sat on a ship that's burning dirty fuel and belching out smoke and, and you know, and hurting the environment and public health. Um, and uh, you know, I think, um, you know, they should behave more responsibly when they're here. But the cruise companies have a great deal of influence here. And John has a front row seat from which to witness this. 
their ships are registered in countries which also happen to be the institution's biggest financial backers. Panama, Liberia, Malta, and the Bahamas. It's clear that the body that polices the seas is in the main financed by countries flying a flag of convenience. They throw all their weight behind efforts to regulate the business as little as possible. But today, John hopes the IMO will finally budge. Countries polluted by shipping, the USA and the European Union, are leading the fight to reduce the amount of sulfur in shipping fuel. Can you help me? We can agree to the 1st of January 2020. After several hours of discussion, the head of the IMO announces that the content of sulfur in fuel will soon be reduced by 3%, which in turn will reduce the incidence of fine particulates. A victory for John and his colleague. So, Billy, are you happy with that? I think so. Are you happy with yeah. that? Yeah. Yes. We often don't have anything good to say about the IMO. I mean, I think this is, an, this is, this is an exception. <laughs> um, they've done really um, what we wanted them to do. It's taken years of struggle to reach this point, but these are small victories. The way the institution is organised and funded and the people who are sent here to negotiate, um, all of that affects the outcome here. Um, and we are very, very clear on this that we don't think um, that the regulations come quick enough or are strict enough. The IMO is not quick to legislate. And yet, cleaner technology already exists. This is the world's first smoke-free cruise ship. Its engines are powered by liquefied natural gas, or LNG. No sulfurs or fine particulates come out of its funnels. Cruise ships have ordered seven of these ships, but that's a drop in the ocean compared to the 300 ships roaming the seven seas. In Malta, Sandrine is still enjoying her Mediterranean cruise. Is the sun in your eyes? It's fine with me. Like the rest of her fellow passengers, she has absolutely no idea of the quality of the air she's breathing aboard the ship. The IMO offers other advantages. This ship sails under the flag of Panama. It's registered in the financial haven and the company pays neither taxes nor social security contributions. All of the employees working on board are subject to the country's laws. One single contract for 55 nationalities. Indian, Filipino, Romanian, Indonesian are represented among the 1,370 strong crew. Despite the unfavorable social legislation, there's no shortage of people seeking work on the ship. 35-year-old Ajay Morut started working here six months ago. One final check, and his day begins. Hello. Ajay is a waiter in one of the restaurants. You prefer some tea or coffee? Coffee. coffee. And where are you from? I'm from Mauritius. Where is that? It's in, uh, um, in, in South Africa, oh. you know? Yeah. Next we have Madagascar. Yeah. Just by the side, oh, by small the island. Oh. Yeah. Very far. Very far. You have to fly a lot to reach it. <laughs> Before joining the ship's crew, Ajay worked in a hotel in Mauritius. He decided to work far from home to earn a better living. What made you decide to come work here? Uh, the work experience and the money. I can earn two or three times as much here as I can in Mauritius. Three times as much. That's 1,300 euros a month. But in order to earn that, Ajay, like his colleagues, have to work every day, 77 hours a week. A far cry from our 40-hour week. It was very hard at first, but you get used to it. It's not a prison. We get rests and we like the work. During the course of his nine-month contract, Ajay will not get a single day off. So any break he does get during the workday is precious. The boat has just moored in Palermo.
just like the passengers, he buys a few souvenirs for his family. Hello. Uh, do you have children's sizes? Yes. This is small. You think a lot about her? Yeah, of course. She's the reason I'm doing this. Ajay has watched his daughter grow up from a distance. When she was born, I wasn't in Mauritius. I wasn't there for her first birthday. She just turned two, and I wasn't there for that either. But I think about her a lot, and about my wife. This sacrifice has brought some advantages. I managed to build my house. I got married, too, and weddings are very expensive. But he only sees his home and family for three months a year. She always says, this is the last time, this is the last time, but when I've been lying around the house doing nothing for three months, <laughs> she lets me go. She has to. The salary is what motivates Ajay to come back aboard. But when life throws up complications, the employment contracts under these flags of convenience offer their employees scant protection. One person has died and four have been injured in Marseille on board the ocean liner Harmony of the Seas. The incident took place during a routine safety drill and has tarnished the image of the world's biggest cruise ship. On September 13, 2016, a lifeboat fell 10 meters during a routine safety exercise. This caused the death of one crew member, while four others were critically injured and transferred to a Marseille hospital. An investigation was opened into the causes of the accident. Minus one lifeboat, the world's biggest cruise ship set sail again the following day. But for the injured, life would never be the same again. on the shores of the Indian Ocean, Kerala forest in southern India. This rubber tree plantation is home to one of those injured on the harmony of the seas. Come on, time for a wash. Two months after his accident, Justin Rajamani is still unable to get up on his own. I'll get the strap. His wife and his mother are at his bedside every morning. Feel his forehead. I think he's got a temperature. Justin broke his lower back in two places and now cannot get about without a wheelchair. His wife, a nurse, has had to give up work so that she could be on hand to help him with his everyday routine. I can't take a shower by myself. Even something as simple as that, I can't do. This photograph is all he has to show for eight years working on the cruise ships as a cook. At 34, he was earning 1,300 euros a month, three times what he would have earned at home. This was my prize for five years spent working for the company the accident ruined any chance of further reward. On the day of the incident, one of his workmates filmed his evacuation. His family is seeing the video for the first time. Justin doesn't understand why the lifeboat suddenly fell into the water. They took you to the hospital in a wheelchair? No, they just used the wheelchairs to take us to the ambulance. When I regained consciousness after the accident, my back hurt terribly. I was in agony. Then I noticed my head was bleeding. He was discharged from the hospital the same day and was cared for by the ship's medical staff. Two days later, his employers sent him home to India for treatment, a 24-hour journey by plane and train. Since coming back home two months ago, He's only been able to sit up for a few minutes a day. 
It would have been better if the company had treated me for a month before sending me home. The airplane and the train journey were very difficult for me. My injuries worsened, and I found it very hard to accept. His family's only hope is to pray for his recovery. His salary was a lifeline for his wife, three-year-old daughter, and his mother. God, please make my son well again. When I see them crying because of me, I feel sad. I don't think I'll ever be able to work for that company again, and I really hope they're going to help me out and give me some money. The company will pay him a mere 15% of his salary until his treatment is complete. It's nowhere near enough for his family to live on or pay for his debts. Justin is hoping to get compensation. His hope rests with a Miami-based lawyer, Julio Alala is an expert in maritime law. 20 years ago, he represented a cruise company as a defendant. Shocked by their methods, he decided to speak up for employees like Justine, employees whose voices weren't heard. Hello, Justin. Uh, okay. This is Julio Ayala, your lawyer. How are you? Today, he's calling Justin to prepare his file. Justin, can... He wants to know in detail the conditions of his return to India. Who decided to sign you off in Naples and send you home? Who made that decision? Do you know? I don't know. That one, I don't know. Yeah. Julio is not surprised that Justin was sent home so promptly. To save money and get rid of a problem. That's what they view these, every, every one of these uh, accidents or illnesses. There's just a problem. All they're concerned about is one thing, and that's the revenue side of the business. This is all cost. He knows he won't be able to get much compensation for Justin because his employment contract is subject to the law of the Bahamas, the tax haven where the harmony of the seas is registered. They will strictly uh, go by the, <clears throat> by the numbers um, that you can prove up economic damages, not the, the special damages, as we call it here, the intangibles, um, loss of enjoyment of life, uh, pain and suffering, mental anguish. Compensation will be all the lower than 10 years ago. Litigation is now settled in a court of arbitration under a judge paid by the company. If 10 years ago we were able to obtain uh, uh, a settlement from, from, from the company for $100,000, for a, a back injury. Today, uh, because of these arbitration clauses, all we can get is $40,000. The amount of compensation they're receiving has been cut in half. We tried to contact the Miami-based American company, but they weren't prepared to discuss Justin's case. And what does our cruise pioneer think of these globalized vessels? Forty years ago, Bob Dickinson was one of the first people to register his ships in tax havens. Now, at 74, he defends this system more vehemently than ever. You know you've been highly criticized for putting your ships under flags of convenience. Yeah, uh, but, but if people understood it, they would be doing the same thing. So, so for example, there, I have been on uh, river ships that have U.S. crew. Once you feel that your job is secure no matter what, then you tend to relax a little bit. We want people sharp and competitive and, and, and eager to please. You know, people from Europe and Asia and Africa and so South America, North America, they're all raising their hands saying, I want to go on board. So we can pick and choose. You know, you're not good enough. I got one over here that's even better. So we can be very selective. And we have the whole world, so. Flags of convenience act as a constraint to these frontierless crews.
Our investigation has opened our eyes to the true nature of these maritime giants. These ships are emblems of globalization, whose reality is at odds with the dream image that the cruise companies are so keen to promote. Thank you.